Thank you again for being here with the session with Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, MD. Dr. Gonzalez graduated from Brown University, Phi Beta Kappa, mag magna cum laude, then worked as a first-time jur journalist, first at Time, Inc., before pursuing pre-medical studies at Columbia. He subsequently received his medical degree from Cornell University Medical, medical College in 1983. Oh, so During a postgraduate immunology fellowship under Dr. Robert A. Good, considered the father of modern immunology, he completed a research study evaluating nutritional therapy in the treatment of advanced cancer. Since 1987, Dr. Gonzalez has been in private practice. His nutritional research has received substantial financial support from Procter & Gamble, Nestle, and the National Cancer Institute. Results from a pilot study published in 1999 described the most positive data in the medical literature for pancreatic cancer. Dr. Gonzalez recently published his first book, The Trophoblast and the Origins of Cancer, and his second, One Man Alone, about to be, rele about to be released. For further information about Dr. about Dr. Gonzalez or his books, contact Dr. Gonzalez, Dr. Gonzalez.com or New Spring Press LLC at NewSpringPress.com. Thank you very much. First, is the mic working okay? No. Louder. They want it louder. How's that? Louder. You do. Louder? That's better? Is that good? Okay, we're in business. Now, I realize some of you may have heard me talk last year, and yes, I'm going to touch on the same points then because this is basically what I do, but the difference is last year I had two lectures, hour and a half each. Today I have a whole day. So it's going to be a lot of talk, and we're going to go into some of the same concepts in some detail. And as I did last year, I'm going to begin, for those of you who are new, who have not heard me talk before, with a little history lesson. You know, we tend to think of the 19th century as kind of a primitive time in science, but actually it was a very fertile time in the history of the biological and medical sciences. A lot of great innovations from that time, whether one is conventional alternative in orientation, really helped change the course of medicine, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. For example, in 1846, Dr. Morton, who was both a dentist and a physician, proved that ether would be useful as an anesthetic, and that actually opened a whole new universe of surgical possibilities. Prior to anesthesia, you know, surgeons were limited. In 1847, Semmelweis up in Vienna showed that if physicians would just wash their hands before delivering babies, you could cut dramatically the incidence of purpura fever, which at that time was devastating the maternity wards of Europe. In fact, I read one study that said in one year in Vienna, 10,000 women died in the hospital as a result of this. This was just an infection that was transmitted during pregnancy. Semmelweis noted that those physicians who would wash their hands before delivering a baby had a significantly reduced incidence of purpura fever. And ironically, a lot of the obstetricians would leave the autopsy room, which was right adjacent to the maternity ward in Semmelweis's hospital, go in there and deliver a baby without washing their hands. Of course, his colleagues were really skeptical about this. This is before Pasteur's work with the germ theory of disease, and it made no sense that something as simple as washing your hands could make a difference. And some of them, out of total defiance, would actually dip their hands in these cad cadavers and then go deliver a baby just to prove Semmelweis was wrong. Of course, he was completely right. Tragically, he ended up dying in a mental institution, bewailing the fact that no one believed what he was doing. Fortunately, Pasteur would come along, and there's still debates about Pasteur's work. You know, he codified the germ theory of disease, and whether one believes that it's the soil that causes the problem, I mean the soil of the human body, or the infectious agent, he did show that infectious organisms, bacteria and fungus, viruses hadn't been identified, could actually cause human disease. And you know, Pasteur was kind of an interesting fellow because he wasn't a, a medical scientist by training, he was an agricultural chemist. And his first work was saving the silk industry in France, and then he saved the wine industry, and then he started getting involved with microbiology in terms of human disease. And his germ theory of disease really did prevent, present a lot of interesting concepts. In fact, his vaccine for rabies is still used today, at least a variation of it. 
Um, around that same time, Virchow, the great German pathologist, was codifying the concepts of immunology. We think of immunology as a modern science. But actually, Virchow showed that there are cells in the body, like the neutrophils and the white, various white cells, that help the body fight off bacteria, viruses, these kind of things. Lister, worked on, Lister developed the work of both Pasteur and Semmelweis and developed the aseptic approach to surgery in the 1880s and 1890s. And of course, like Morton's work before with anesthesia, this opened up again a whole new realm of surgical possibilities because previously so many patients would die after surgery from infection and Lister just showed by, certain, by just certain techniques, like washing your hands in an antiseptic lotion, could really make an enormous difference. Of course, although we don't think of Gregor Mendel as a medical scientist, he was kind of, again, like Pasteur, an interesting fellow. He wasn't trained as a scientist. He was a, he was a monk who actually failed the course to become a secondary teacher. And he had a pea, pa pea patch, and all of you who took high school biology know the story. And in this pea patch, he really discovered the fundamental laws of genetics. And he gets criticized. They say his lab notebooks weren't as good as they should have been, but so what? He basically codified the basic theory that characteristics could, were inherited in a predictable fashion. Prior to that, of course, scientists believe in all the eminent universities that you can inherit acquired characteristics. If your grandfather lost his finger in an accident, your father did, there's a chance you would have to be born without a finger. Of course, it's nonsense. Mendel showed that. And again, although we don't think of Mendel as a medical researcher, his work is really the underpinning of all modern molecular biology. All modern molecular biology really deals with DNA, which is the genetic material. And our interest in DNA really goes back to Mendel, so we really owe him quite a bit. And it was into this extraordinary time in the biological sciences, where a lot of research was being done, a lot of new ideas were coming to the surface, that John Beard was born, my hero. He was born in 1858 in Manchester, England, did a secondary school in a, what we would call a private school in England, they call them public schools, went on to the University of London where he studied zoology, and his main interest was embryology, specifically the development of the nervous system in invertebrates, which is a very, to us, maybe an obscure area of academic science. You know, it's interesting. Linus Pauling always said, you know, you, we shouldn't be too critical of these esoteric ivory, ivory tower scientists who spend their life studying something that seems so irrelevant to anything that would be useful. He said, very often you can see the universe, you get developed universal laws from the most obscure investigations. It's kind of like William Blake, the English poet. In a grain of sand, you can see the universe. Well, Linus Pauling was a great proponent of that. He said, we shouldn't be critical of ivory tower scientists doing obscure work because out of their discoveries, there may come laws that will change the way we think about the universe, the way we think about ourselves. Beard was of that ilk. He was a very meticulous, obsessive scientist who was really concerned with a very simple thing, the, the development of the sense organs in parasitic worms that lived off of other worms. After finishing his undergraduate work at the University of London, like so many smart people in his era, he went abroad, first to the University of Würzburg in Germany and then the University of Freiburg, where he received his SCD, the equivalent of a doctorate, in 1884. And I have a copy of his thesis, which is about four inches thick. It's the most extraordinary document. Again, let anyone think that the 19th century was a kind of primitive living in the cave time in science. All you have to do is read that book. You can realize how elegant, the, elegant their thinking about embryology and basic science really was. And his thesis dealt with the development of specialized sense organs in a parasitic worm that lived off of other worms, which seems, again, about as esoteric area of investigation as you might find. After finishing his uh, PhD work, he was fortunate enough to get a postdoc fellowship at the University of Freiburg, and he continued his research again into the development of the sense organs in a parasitic worm that lived off of other worms. But then he had an interesting um, fortune came upon him. He got a grant to come to the U.S. to study at the Black Lake Biological Research Center up in the Adirondacks. Now, those of you who are familiar with New York, you know, tend to think of New York in terms of New York City with its eight or nine million people in this extraordinary suburbia and all, of, you know, all the farms are beaten up by this cancerous growth of the metropolis. But if you go north of Albany, it's really wild up there. The Adirondack Forest Preserve, six million acres perpetually kept in wilderness by state decree, is an extraordinary place. I mean, we don't have mountains equivalent to the Rocky Mountains, but by eastern standards, they're pretty, pretty high. And there are river gorges and mountain lions and all kinds of wildlife. It's a very primitive place. Well, during the 19th century, there was a research center on Black Lake, which is one of the high Adirondack mountain lakes. 
It was a very sophisticated research institute. And Beard went there for a summer, 